Thank you for joining us. I'm Peter Bergen of New America. <laughs> um, and we're honored to have Jerry Van Dyke um, come on uh, to discuss his new book, Without Borders, The Akani Network and the Road to Kabul. Uh, if you want to purchase the book, there's a bot button in the right-hand corner of the screen. Um, Jerry has been a correspondent variously for the New York Times and a consultant also with CBS. He's traveled repeatedly to Afghanistan since the 80s when he was covering the Afghan-Soviet war, for which he was nominated for a Pulitzer uh, during the 80s when he was working for the New York Times. He's also worked for National Geographic magazine, hence uh, all the interesting uh, weapon he has behind him. Um, and uh, after 9-11, he went back to Afghanistan and Pakistan reporting for CBS. In 2008, he was kidnapped by the Taliban. Uh, and he's written a book, another book, very interesting book called Captive about trying to untangle how that all happened. Um, and he's presently working on a book about Pat Tillman, who was killed in Turkani territory, the U.S. Uh, football player, back in 2004. So, Jerry, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about uh, some of the big themes and stories of your book, and then I'll engage you in some Q&A. And uh, we'll, anybody who has a question, just put it in the Slido, and I'll pass those on to Jerry. So, Jerry, over to you. Thank you, Peter, for uh, the introduction, and especially for hosting this event for me. Um, in 1981, when I lived in the mountains in eastern Afghanistan with Jalal Adin Haqqani and his 16 of his fellow tribesmen and his younger brother, Ibrahim, I noticed one day uh, an, an Egyptian army major came to visit us and he did not like me. Uh, Jalalin put him in the same room where I was staying. It was dirt floor and such in this big mud compound up in the mountains. And he asked me uh, if I knew anything about the about Anwar Sadat, the president of, of Egypt. And I said, yes, he'd just been assassinated. And I was surprised that he didn't know this, but he was very happy. And I realized during the time that he was there that he had a certain power, it seemed, over Jalaluddin. We had three uh, Sam 7... Uh, anti-aircraft missiles, very hard to come by at that time. And he demanded, it seemed, the right to shoot to shoot one. And so he did. And as my, my interpreter said, he killed many rocks. But he all, that also, while he was trying to shoot down this Soviet helicopter, let the Soviets know where we were. So he put us in considerable danger. So when Al-Qaeda was formed years later, it dawned on me that even then I thought at that very time that Jalaluddin here with a small group of men is part of something larger than this war in Afghanistan. Otherwise, why would this, this Egyptian army major come here? And when Al Qaeda rose, I realized, bang, perhaps he is part of what became Al Qaeda. And so after I was, many years later, after I was kidnapped, CBS would not let me go back at that time to it wouldn't let me go east of Turkey, they said, uh, for fear that I would get in trouble again. And so I had, by that time, already written something for the Army War College on um, the rise of what we call here in the West Islamic fundamentalism in South Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and Kashmir. And so I wanted to go to the Middle East and see if I could do the same thing. And at the same time, finally look into the links that I knew existed uh, and the, among various jihadi groups and the role that the Akhanis played in that. I got a grant from the foundation, eventually a book, and then a book contract. And then I embarked upon this journey in late 2013, starting in Yemen, I was there for four months to learn, to go to school, went to a Muslim Brotherhood school in Sana'a, and then to Saudi Arabia, uh, and from there, I had, after this is about seven months into it, I had a, a lunch one day in Bahrain with Jamal Khashoggi, uh, who also was in Afghanistan as a journalist, as well as working for the government in the 1980s. And so as two old Afghan hands, if you will, were sitting uh, in this expensive restaurant in Bahrain, uh, where he had a, you know, he had wine for lunch and he talked about his joys of smoking cigars. So on one hand, he was a very liberal 
uh, if you will, West, not Western, but just a modern urban man. But yet he made it very clear that he was very much a part of and understood that ISIS was, was what he called raw Wahhabism, that Saudi Arabia was Wahhabi and what bothered him uh, considerably and was the same thing that had bothered me considerably was that how did the Afghans who in the Mujahideen in the 1980s with all the weapons that they got from uh, the US, from China and the Brits and the, and the French and others, not once was there one suicide bombing, not were there any indications ever of trying to kill women or children. They held on to their ancient tribal codes, pretty much the Pashtuns, was, there were all ethnic groups were involved in this of not harming women and children. How is it that it, after 9-11, there was this complete change? And what, what Khashoggi was talking about was you have to, it was this raw Wahhabism which emanates from, from Saudi Arabia initially and find out how much of that has become a part of Afghanistan and what has this done to that country. And so I had watched like, like Peter, like anybody who you know, in the audience here or among all of you who are, who are with us, uh, who's been in Afghanistan since 9-11, what a rigid country it has become. Because when I was there at the very beginning of, yes, women were not, uh, not, not involved in things, but they certainly didn't hide. They were certainly evident around in the countryside. I was not allowed to talk to them or certainly not to take a picture, but they were very much a part of the country, but everything had changed. And so it was a combination of my ties to the, to the Akanis where they were so good to me, treating me so well in the most memorable time. And real quickly is that when, I came, when it came time to leave, that somehow, because I, I didn't see them any time when I was there, Jalaluddin and or his 16 men, member of his fellow, of his fellow tribe, um, found two camels, bought two camels, and with half of his men, we walked in the camels were minesweepers. We walked at dusk through a minefield. What he was willing to do, which he had done before, was risk the possibly the at least the legs, the life of all of his men to protect me, uh, to make sure that I always the guest got to oh made my way back to Pakistan. So I had this close tie to Akani, which I never really let go. And that was one reason why I went to the Middle East to try and figure out what in the world was really go going on. And that led me beginning in, in, in Yemen and particularly in Saudi Arabia, where I learned that over time that when ISIS rose, for example, that they would say, oh, the, uh, the, the Saudis I met, the fire will not come here. They instinctively knew that they, it's going to go everywhere else, but they would be protected. And in Yemen, where, which, uh, where I spent four months before I made my way to Saudi Arabia, I learned that from, initially from a man named Tariq al-Fadli, who was bin Laden's best friend, his father was close to bin Laden's father. Uh, and that went back to, to the very beginning when the two men came this, from a certain part of the Hadramat down in, in Yemen that he became the founder of what the United States and its allies eventually called Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And what he told me was in the principal enemy of Saudi Arabia. And that, that was a surprise because of the close ties among all of the, what we called, or I didn't call so much, but others did Arab Afghans who came to, with the backing of the United States and with in working in tandem with all its Arab allies in the 1980s, uh, these thousands of young men came to fight with the Afghans in this great jihad uh, with a capital J, which even no one, not one person today in Afghanistan post 9-11 has ever used jihad in that sense. They always refer to jihad, again, with a capital J, so important to the Afghan-Soviet war. So all of these things led to uh, particularly in Yemen now, my being told 
time and time again that Al Qaeda does not exist in a vacuum. Al Qaeda, there are so many different types of Al Qaeda here. There's an Al Qaeda run by this commander. There's an Al Qaeda, an Al -Qaeda run by the president. There's a, another Al Qaeda run by the vice president. So it was becoming clear to me that Al Qaeda was not simply something that had grown out of nothing. Uh, or the companionship and the camaraderie that existed among the Arabs in, in Afghanistan, but was backed by Arab governments. And in particular, this, now there's, a, as we know today, there's, there's no love lost between Yemen and, and Saudi Arabia, which goes back thousands of years. But uh, the very simple fact is that uh, Al Qaeda and its and it's antecedents, you know, ISIS and, and Boko Haram and all of these things are very much alive today. And everybody from in all my entire travels from Khartoum to Egypt to to uh, Saudi Arabia to throughout throughout all the countries that I visited uh, in the Middle East and in Turkey, which is uh, arguably part of the Middle East, uh, it all came back to the rise of the Arab, what I call the Arabization, the Wahhabism of Afghanistan, and which is very much, uh, I think, of great concern to, will be of great concern to us because the war in Afghanistan is certainly not finished. It's going to come back in different forms. And my book was the, it was the study of this and the learning, in my view, of what essentially is a in the eyes of jihadists, in the eyes of their backers, whether they're rich Saudi princes or elements of governments, is a, is a religious war, which began, as we all know, at shortly after the, 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 the founding of Islam. And, and that war continues today. And we have to, in my view, we have to find a way to, to, to not turn this into a war of civilizations, you know, the Huntington the Huntington thesis, but um, so my book was an exploration of, of all of this and ultimately using Jalaluddin and now what has become what the US and its allies call the Akani Network as a symbol of the rise of the jihadist movement, uh, which goes back centuries to as a symbol of this, and using that family with which I have certain ties going back to my time with them and they continue today to try and understand the, their movement from their side as well as to, exp and to explain to the West what is happening. And for my own personal reasons to try and find out why the Akani Network in my view as I was learning was so influential today. And Peter's gonna talk a little bit about this later. We were talking briefly about it before, how the rise of his sons have uh, simply a continuation of the, the, the growth and the power of what I consider arguably the most influential, most powerful jihadist force, in part because it's backed by the Pakistani army in the world today. And that is the essence of the book. Okay, well, well um, you know, Siraj Haqqani is the son of Jalaluddin Haqqani, and he's the military commander of the Haqqani network. Uh, according to the UN, um, he's also part of, the, part of the leadership council of Al-Qaeda. But so can you reflect... Uh, there was reports on Saturday that Siraj Haqqani made comments that position himself as the real leader of the Taliban, um, which raises kind of an interesting question. Now, the Akhani network have always been a kind of slightly separate from the Kandahari Taliban in the South. What What is the nature of that relationship? Because uh, it seems to me, without having any of the expertise you have, that the Akhani's have been kind of the at the forefront of the Taliban's military successes, um, which might account for why Siraj thinks he's really the leader. Um, so what is the nature of that relationship? Are there tensions between it? Might the Taliban split along, you know, Haqqani network in Eastern Afghanistan, Southern Afghanistan, the Kandahari Taliban, or are they united enough so that they will kind of continue um, on? 
Uh, fascinating uh, information you have, Peter. Um, I wasn't aware of this. The Sarajuddin was, as I'm sure most people here today know, was the military commander uh, eventually in the end of the, of the Taliban. And it was the Akani network that took Kabul. The Kandahari Taliban came later. 2015, when I began to meet with the Akhanis again, Ibrahim Akhani, Siraj Adin's uncle, Jalal Adin's younger brother, said to me, we are, and this is a quote, a separate front from the mm -hmm. Taliban. We have never been a part of them. In 2019, I was working with, uh, with the FBI or in, in in um at the embassy in kabul and the the head of the fbi a really uh, a fine man because it's very unusual to find someone in the fbi or in the government who will allow you to to try and in this case help them um sent me to uh, to see the well i wanted to go on my own also to see the economies in in islamabad and Siraj Adin said to me, the only person who could get to us, that um, nobody in the US peacekeeping mission had access to them. The Pakistani army was keeping them, as he put it, behind a curtain. In 2022, after the Taliban took power, Siraj Adin, it was in February 2002, went to Kandahar, where he gave a speech. It came out, the BBC reported it, it was all in Dari and in Pashto. Um, never, I've never seen it translated into English, in which he said, we used five, 1,570, well, we sent 1,570 Afghans, if you will, to paradise. What he was saying was that we, the Akani network, are a part of you, the Taliban, and that we are one, we are together, and that we have suffered greatly. And Siraj Adin's best friend and mentor told me that that was his way of reaching out to Kandahar, to the Taliban leadership and saying that we are one. He said this was the one, it was a good thing for him to do. Since then, there has been this, there is a divide today, very much so in the Akhani's run Kabul. The Kandahari Taliban rule in Kandahar. The head of the Taliban, the Emir of the Taliban, wants to move the headquarter, the capital of the country, to Kandahar. Uh, the among the the biggest problem in the, for Americans today about the Taliban is the discrimination against, to put it mildly, women. The Akan, as as Christiane Amanpour showed us in in her. Meaning with her interview with the Connie, she co she commented on the fact that he had used women, had women in his the interior ministry. And it's one man, it's the leader of the Connie of, of the Taliban, Akinzada, who is uh, opposed, he's, he is in the eyes of, of the Akanis, still acting like a village mullah. And so that tension that uh, exists has now, according to with this latest statement, come out where it this is potentially uh, we don't know what will happen dangerous. Yeah, so you so you're saying that the Akhani's are uh, more open to having women work in the workforce, and the commander of the faithful uh, is kind of you know he's the person who's sort of nixing that. Which I, I mean, it is a theocratic state, and if you're the commander of the faithful, you are in charge. So um but you, you this is kind of a, a a bone of contention between them yeah oh definitely uh i i have never met suraj Adin. i do not have direct access to him uh, i would like to someday but yeah i use his mentor and his best friend um who uh now that his father is gone his his mentor and his his best friend who keeps me informed and he has said that everybody around the uh the commander of the faithful uh, is afraid to stand up to him. And so they follow the rules. And as Peter just told us, he is, this is not a democracy. This is a theocracy. And so it's, it's a one man rule. The, what Abraham Akani told me is that they, they inoculated all their daughters uh, for COVID. When the U.S. began to 
bomb them. Uh, and this, this is where I, one thing I wanted to get into later or a little bit, which I didn't at the front. This is, a, this is also very much a class war. The Connies were dirt poor and they have risen over the above the, if you will, the tribal aristocracy in, in their own tribe. And this, this is something that is, goes on throughout, throughout the Middle East, not unlike that which is going on in the US, only it's more violent there. And he said, when the US began to bomb them, it was because of a tribal leader in, their, in the Zadran tribe, that they sent all their daughters to protect them to the Middle East. He made it very clear to me, as Ibrahim did, and this is where we argued that they were still Hanafi, we would not, we were, we do not oppose statues. In other words, we would not have destroyed the famous Buddhist statues at Bamiyan in what the Taliban did in 2000. That may, but so then, you know, on the other hand, I mean, the other dimension of this is, you know, it's the UN that's reporting that Siraj Akhani is part of the leadership of the Council of Al Qaeda. This is not, I mean, the report is publicly available. A new report just came out yesterday, but there is, you know, previous reports, and these reports by the UN monitoring cell for the Taliban and Al Qaeda are very thorough, and they're based on reporting by member states. So, yeah, okay, the Akhani's may have a slightly more enlightened view of the role of women in the workforce, although it's all extremely relative. But what about their relationship with Al Qaeda? I I, I agree, it exists, and they admit that. Um, even more than that. Um, after, after Sirajuddin gave his speech in Kandahar in February 2002, uh, the Saudis invited him and his younger brother Anas, who's probably 30, 31, um, who is seen as the future of the Akhani network, to Saudi Arabia to introduce them. And it, I firmly believe, and I, have, I don't have the, the information that you have, and I certainly believe it about what, what the UN is saying, but I've even heard that, our, that, that Siraj Yadin was, his, his name was bantered around as being the replacement for bin Laden. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, by the way, that would be a kind of a smart choice. I mean, it's a puzzle why they haven't named a successor to Ayman al-Zawari, who was killed in July of 2022. Right, uh, right. Siraj, you know, that that would actually be a, a, a very interesting choice. Of course, hitherto, the leaders of Al-Qaeda have been Arabs, not um, people from South Asia. But um, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, they say it could be Saf al-Adel, but he's, he's, he's yeah. Egyptian in Tehran. Um, right, I just, but the links, you know, it, the, what, some of you may know, but the in 1973, when the Akhani's began to fight and always separate from the Mujahideen, and they began to work with the Pakistanis, the Pakistanis introduced them to the Saudis. They gave them passports and they have been working there for decades. So, uh, and very un, it's very unusual, but Jalal al-Din, after his wife, first wife died, married a Yemeni. And he lived in Abu Dhabi for a while. So those children, some of those boys, because uh, we have to keep the women out of it in this case, could are are they're half Arab as well as half Pashtun. So wow. the 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 Akani tie to the Middle East is 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 considerable. Let me ask you uh, a couple of. Let me ask you. So you mentioned these trips to Yemen and Saudi, you mentioned meeting Tariq Al-Fadli, who uh, is a very interesting guy that I never have. I mean, I, I would be very interested in meeting him too. He, uh, an old friend of Bin Laden's, a Yemeni, uh, who kind of was running the, uh, you know, was probably behind um, some of the terrorist attacks in Yemen. Um, he, I think he, you know, plays, played a, some sort of important political role in Yemen. Um, as far as I can tell, he seems to have disappeared. But tell us about Tariq al-Fadli and his relationship with bin Laden in Yemen. And how did you meet him? And also, you know, you've been kidnapped by the Taliban in 2008. I mean, like these, these, this kind of exactly. reporting is pretty tricky. That's true. He was under house arrest in, uh, in Sana. It was arranged by... Um, uh, 
two journalists, uh, one worked for AFP, uh, Zange France Press, uh, and the other for the uh, Yem Yemeni State uh, News Agency, who arranged for me to meet with him. We met, I met with him twice. We talked at length. Um, he was very, very polite. He, one time he, uh, the second time we met, there were a lot of men there. Well, I'll go back to the first time. When I walked in to meet him, I was afraid, I, without a doubt. Um, and no one said anything, but he was very gracious. And because I had been with Jalal Adin, who he had liked so much, which said that that told me two things. One, that the founder of, and it was very, and he acknowledges the founder of Al-Qaeda in, in Yemen, knew, knew Jalal Adin and that they were working together back before Al-Qaeda was before Al Qaeda was formed, which makes it very clear of Jalal Adin's ties to to Al Qaeda, and therefore he certainly would not bother his children to become involved in that in any way. Um, according according to people around him, yeah, Bin Laden, Bin Laden wrote a will, and he willed so much of what he had to Tariq Al Fadli, mm -hmm. and their their ties were that close. And he was, in effect, the emissary of bin Laden to, to Yemen. They wanted to create a, 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 a theocracy, not unlike that they hoped that they could create in, uh, in Afghanistan. They wanted to start with Yemen. Bin Laden uh, wanted to use Yemen as his, as his, as his, uh, his base. He had nowhere else to go because it was he had married a Yemeni. That was his father's home. That couldn't come about. So everything went through Tariq Al Fadli. It was Tariq Al Fadli who told me, and I think this is important of of Jalal Adin's ties to Bin Laden and also his ties. And this came from his meetings in Khartoum uh, when and this, he's going to escape. The man's going to escape my name. Maybe you'll know him. Uh, who set up these meetings uh, and brought jihadists and uh, even people like Carlos the Jackal, everybody together to create a a a a new world after the uh, after the after the uh, Al Qaeda after the Taliban after the the Mujahideen won in Khartoum, and this even people like <clears throat> uh, leaders and uh, commanders in or generals in the Pakistani army were there. And this was in, this is where Jalal Adin and Tariq Al Fadli spent time together. So it was the internationalization, if you will, through through Tariq Al Fadli into the Arab world with, with Jalal Adin. Um, Tariq Al Fadli um, had ties to the top of of to uh, uh, what's his name, the Salah, the president of of Yemen, uh, uh, Ali Abdullah Salah. He had ties to the vice president. And because what Terry Kaufadley's credential was, is that his father, uh, and it goes back, he said 700 years was the sultan of this particular part of Yemen. And the British, the British uh, sent the father away to uh, uh, Zanzibar, I think it was. And so when he returned, he, he created a city in or town in, in his fiefdom there in Yemen called Zanzibar. So uh, Tariq Al-Fadli had the, and has today, because he's still alive, the tribal, the tribal power of being the son of a sultan. And it was when he was living in, it was when he was living in, uh, after when the British came and then after the, the rise of the communists in, in uh, following the, the revolution, if you will, in Yemen in 1967, aristocrats like Tariq al-Fadli all went to live in Saudi Arabia. And it was there that he became, um, through his older brother, uh, if you will, radicalized, which sent him to, to uh, Afghanistan, where he became, because of the family ties that goes back to the beginning, so many probably centuries, well, no, not centuries, to his father, to Jalal, to Bin Laden's father, to, who was simply a, a, a very, very wealthy man, while, well, Tariq Al-Fadli's father was uh, 
the Sultan had been the Sultan of this part of Yemen for 700, or that family for 700 years. So that's where the alliance allegiance began, which um, Tarek Al Fadli has. When I was there and I left in 2014, certainly kept alive. Yeah, so these are some uh, audience questions. Uh, is there an ideology of the, are the Haqqanis ideological? Uh, good question. They will say to Ibrahim, and I have to use Ibrahim as my main source here because I haven't talked with uh, his, his nephew or his Khalil, his other brother. Um, he said that in addition to being a separate front and not being, he, he, he kept insisting that he was Hanafi. And I said, no, you've changed too much. You're using suicide bombers. And why in the world do you do this? And we talked, argued at length about this, but he would come back to the fact that uh, we have not changed. It's only you Americans who have changed. To us, there's no difference between the Americans and the Russians. You're both in our land. Why are you here? We want you to leave. When you, we may, maybe in the future, we will invite you back. But for them, they saw themselves simply, I mean, this is Ibrahim talking to me and I'm saying it's the exact truth, that we are patriots, if you will. We are, our home is Afghanistan. And he was, and one time when he uh, lamented that um, they were stuck in Islamabad, he, he said to me, maybe I'll, when we were ending one of our, our meetings, he gave me a hug and he said, maybe the next time I will see you, it will be in Afghanistan. Um, I think that they're, they're not so, and I'll give you one other example, which in my view says, and I'm certainly don't want to give anybody the impression that I uh, support uh, the way in which they have come, <laughs> the treating, uh, the killing so many women and children, is that there was um, Sarajanin's, one of Sarajin's brothers named Nasruddin, I don't know if you know him, Peter, who was the link to the Middle East. And in 2012, the US started, according to the Akhanis and to others, was putting pressure on Pakistan to move the Akhanis away from the border, get them back. And, Suraj, and so Nasruddin was told by the Pakistanis to move. And he said to him, he, became, he was arrogant. And he said, this is our land. We are not moving from our land. Our land goes all the way to the Atak, A-T-T-O-C-K, what we call the Indus River. Um, and shortly thereafter, he went to, uh, on a Friday, he went to buy to a bakery to buy some bread. A Jeep pulled up out in front. Men got out and shot him to death. And I asked, um, I asked, Ibrahim, who killed him? He said, well, I don't know. It's either the CIA or the ISI. What I'm saying is that, and the reason that he talked like this uh, was because, and I'm getting ahead of, ahead of ourselves, the TTP, the Tariq e Taliban, Pakistan, the, the, the Pakistan Taliban movement, and the, whose, whose leaders are in Afghanistan, and the Taliban are one in the same. They just have different agendas at the moment. They are Pashtuns who want their, what they call their land back, which ends at the, for some at the Indus River, for others all the way to Islamabad. And that goes back to 1805 when the British sent uh, 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 in a, a delegation, if you will, and across the, across the Indus River into the land of the Afghans to Peshawar. They've always considered that their land. The Duran line, as many of you know, which came about in 1893, dividing the Pashtuns in two, which today is the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan is something that they do not want to last. So are they ideological? I think that they are 100% ideological in the fact that they do not want anybody in Afghanistan except Afghans. They want a theocracy. And I think because of their natural human ambition, they are definitely al aligned, as Peter said, to the larger, I'm convinced of this, the larger jihadist movement in the world, which is against any Western encroachment on their land. And in that case, yes, they're ideological. Let me ask you something about, so I'm confused on, uh, on this issue. So there is the madrasa called the Haqqaniya Madrasa, which many of the Taliban have attended 
I'll, and then, of course, there's the Akani family. Uh, if you attend this Akani Akania Madrasa, do you sometimes take on the name of Hakani as kind of an honorific, or is it only a family thing? Okay, uh, uh, Peter's referring to a particular Madrasa in Peshawar uh, that I'm sure most of you know about. Um, the what I did was I that is called a Diobandi uh, Madrasa. And the Diobandis came out of the uh, struggle for independence in against. And, and Jerry, just to interrupt you, just for context, the 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 man who ran it was called Sami Ul Haq, right? So, and he was right. fascinated relatively recently. But but so, yeah. So there's the family, and then there's the madrasa, and what are the relate? You know, how does this relate to the Taliban? They the reason I was going off about the Diobandi. The Diobandi yeah. are headquartered in north of Delhi. This al Haq went to a deal, went to deal bond after, in a, after partition, he founded the Akania Madrasa. The, um, the Akania Madrasa, and by the way, there were no madrasas in Afghanistan before the 1973. This is important to note. And it's the rise of, of the US Saudi Pakistani alliance and the rise of the Diobandis, which led to, to the the vast majority to all of the madrasas that exist. At that time, nobody in the Akani family had ever gone to a madrasa. Jalal Adin never went to a madrasa. He went, he was involved, he never went to university, uh, Kabul University, but he was involved in all the, in the student movement, if you will, which was again, it was between, you know, the struggle or the debates among communist students and, who were lured to Marxism and those who were, uh, lured to, to Islam. So, so Jalal al-Din went for the one year schooling at, at, this, at the uh, Kani Madra, Diobandi Madras in Peshawar. There al Haq asked him to stay on for another year as an instructor. I think, uh, and to answer first your question, there comes a time in an Afghan's life, an Afghan man's life when he, and I don't know the, the, the etymology of all of this, but he is allowed to change his name. Gobadin Hekmatyar, who all know, that's not his real name. A man I deal with a lot, I'm sure Peter knows his name, Dean Muhammad. Um, that is not his real name. So Jalal Dean took on the name of Hakani as his last name. Okay. Therefore, it became the family name. Gotcha. Yeah, that that helps uh, that helps explain that a lot. Um, another question from the audience. Um, you know, to what extent do the, do oh, this is a great question. Do other do other people in the Taliban refer to the Akani network, or is that kind of a U.S. government construction or a journalistic construction? I mean, do they? We've talked about how the Taliban, how the Akani network see the other parts of the Taliban, but what about how do the Taliban see the Akhanis? I've never heard, I've never heard an Afghan use the word Akani network. Interesting. Okay. Um, uh, this one is from Anne. How do you see your own future relationship with the Akhanis in light of their evolution? What did you discover on your latest visit to the region? I've tried to uh, tell myself no more. I have to stop this tie to this link to the Akhanis. However, um, even now, as, as I sit here with you, uh, three different groups, all in all American. Um, one, um, a, a, a evangelical Christian movement, if you will, in, in, in the West. Um, lawyers and um, former government officials have come to me seeking my help to reach the economies on behalf of, of in one case with the, with the evangelical Christian uh, group, uh, a, a hostage um, who may or may not be uh, held by the economies, but because of the power of the economies, they've not been able to get any help anywhere else. They've spent a lot of money. They've come to me. Uh, others have, two others have come to me about the economies. Uh, 
the Akanis called me about three weeks ago, welcoming me back. That's code for we want you to come back in some way, someone told me. So I try to leave, but I, I feel an obligation because of my ties to them, because they trust me. Uh, I walk, I realize I'm walking a very fine line, um, but they, they want my help. They, his Sarajuddin's best friend reaches out to me. We talk frequently. Um, now the family wants me to come back. I see my future still. Um, it's not finished yet with me and the economies. Yeah. When was the last time you were in Afghanistan, Pakistan? 2019. 2019. But the, the situation, of course, has changed. I mean, Siraj Akhani is really the most important person in Afghanistan right now, because as the um, Minister of the Interior, I mean, for Americans who may not be familiar with or it, it's sort of like running the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, uh, the intelligence services. I mean, he controls the prison system. He controls all the national security apparatus. And you say, as you point out, they also control the capital of Kabul. So like, he is really the most important person in the country right now. Exactly. And he, it was his um, cousin who called me and said, we welcome you back. We welcome you back. Um, and he called me twice. And I'm still not sure if he's just being polite or if yeah. they had um, if they have a reason. Well, as you know, it's a public knowledge that the I mean, we've had what, four Americans who've been taken and since released. We've had five British citizens who've been taken and since released, almost certainly all in the custody of the economies or, or their kind of um, you know, people that are in their employ. So, I mean, if you were to go back, wouldn't you be taking a pretty big risk? And when you were kidnapped in 2008, was it which element of the Taliban uh, you know, kidnapped you? I'm, I, I don't take lightly the, uh, what you just asked me and at, at all. And yes, I think about that 100%. Um, it's not just the economies. It's as one of the as people around them said, you have to watch out for Iranians in the Iranian element here. It was very anti-American, which is very strong because of the Shiite uh, Shia population uh, in, in 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 Kabul and elsewhere. Um, so I'm I'm very much aware of that. Um, and the second part of your question was what. Um, well, let, let me let me go jump to because we're we have actually kind of a fair amount of audience questions. I want to try and get to them. So, what are your thoughts on international engagement with the Taliban? I mean, this is a big dilemma. Um, and how long do you think the Taliban will be able to hold on to Kabul? Uh, obviously, you know, the international element is the last time the Taliban were in power, three countries recognized them: Saudi Arabia, the United Emirates, and Pakistan. This time around, no countries recognize them. And yet, you know, there's 97% uh, of Afghans are living below the poverty line. It's got the highest rates of highest levels of hunger in any country in the world, according to the United Nations. So, you know, the international community, United States, whatever, has a, a kind of dilemma on its hands that the Taliban do run the show. They, and in fact, as you know, Jerry, very well, before 9-11, there was a fairly active op opposition movement. And there's no really active opposition to speak of right now. And they're better armed this time around. They've got American military gear that the United States left behind. Um, they are in charge. So how do you, you know, what is the right American policy approach to, to this question? What I do know is that the U.S. has sent a number of delegations to meet with Siraj Adin. It has sent a... And one thing that's worrying the Iranians is that the U.S. has become closer to the Taliban. This is what I am hearing from them. Uh -huh. I do know that Doha is, you know, Qatar is our is is our embassy, if you, American embassy now. Just as this, we use Switzerland as our embassy to handle American affairs in Iran. So we use Qatar as our embassy in in. Um, in uh, Afghanistan, and we have sent the U.S. has sent delegations to to Doha, and they're meeting with the Akhani's, and they're meeting with others. But 
the fact that we have sent, and it's certainly quiet, sent delegations to Shiraz Yadin means, and the fact that this is upsetting the Iranians because we're drawing closer to them, to, to the Taliban, and they put the two together, I don't think, and I certainly agree with everything that the, you have said in, in the question here is asked, um, because of what the Taliban are and what they what they have done, and most vividly, of course, for everybody is is women. They, what they said to me also regarding women recently, and I don't know, of course, if this is true. That look for March twenty first, which is Afghan New Year, uh, for a change. Uh, I don't know if something special is going to happen, but they they certainly they certainly uh, talked about. That's interesting. Um, this is a question from Hassan. Um, additional one. How long will the Taliban be able to hold on to Kabul in your assessment? I mean, is this uh, obviously last time that they seized Kabul in 96, they, they held on for it for five years and they lost it when the U.S. intervened. As right. I, go ahead. Kabul is, as uh, Afghan followers know, in this question you may know, is a, is a, is a Tajik city. This, the curriculum in the schools is in Dari. It's in Persian. It's not in Pashto. Uh, the, the Taliban are Kandaharis, they're from the south. So it is a very liberal, you know, Persian, the culture is Persian. Um, so they are outsiders. But all, you have to note that around the entire country, and this comes from the former mayor, who's a Tajik, who's now, he stayed with me after, after the, um, the youngest mayor in the history of, of Kabul, he was 39 years old. And he's, I know his father, who was, um, spokesman for the Mujahideen. And he stayed with me after uh, the U.S. Uh, withdrawal. He now lives in Canada. He's, he stays and he, he's very close to elements on the ground, particularly the Masood, Masood son's element uh, in Panjshir and in the north. And he said that the Akhanis have the greatest military alliances throughout Afghanistan. Yeah. So it's not just Kabul, which is not their homeland. Yeah, and just so the, for the audience, um, you know, the Akhanis, I mean, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, they're sort of traditional, it's like the, there's a Zadran tribal grouping in eastern Afghanistan, but where where else are there, what are, what are the areas that they completely control versus what the other elements of the Taliban control? Um, uh they have gone so far as to mount attacks before, this is before the fall of, meaning before the, before the Ghani government, they were mounting attacks in, in Herat, which is on the Persian, which is on the Iranian border. There was a fellow, and they were, they held, they kidnapped um, in 2016, a, a, a Kevin King, an American, and a fellow named Timothy Weeks, an Australian. And I talked to Kevin Weeks, and he was held for three years in Kandahar. So the the Akani reach is not as, and Peter knows it's it's they're long. It's the uh, it's east southeastern Afghanistan, and one reason they were were successful is that their militia was based in Logar province, and they were able to reach Ka uh, the capital Kabul before the Taliban. So the Akani's come up, are closer to. Uh, geographically to the tribal areas of Pakistan, to Pakistan and that it's backing itself where, they, where they've always been able to uh, have sanctuary. So they, they operate, they do not operate in the North, but ISIS or ISK as some will call it, uh, Islamic State of Khorasan and ISIS are in the North. They are beginning to threaten uh, Uzbekistan. They're beginning to threaten Tajikistan. And they are um, the Akani's enemies. So I don't, Akani certainly do not control the entire country, but I would say that they control. But I cannot, it's not Jerry on the ground who gives this information that this comes from the Tajiks, that they do so, have considerable power. So the Pakistani Taliban, you mentioned at the beginning, is now sort of headquartered in Afghanistan, which is, you know, kind of the ironies keep piling up. Uh, but do the Haqqanis have any kind of restraining uh, ability to restrain the Pakistani Taliban from attacks into Pakistan? After all, as you mentioned, the Haqqanis do have a long relationship with the Pakistani intelligence service. How does this all work? Uh, I don't, I wish I had an answer to that. What I can say is that 
and again, this goes to Srajanin's mentor, best friend, told me that the ISI had set up itself in Kandahar. The ISI is in, in, is in Kabul. So that Pakistani alliance with, with the Khanis, if it exists, and I have not heard any, any indication from the Khanis that it has changed, I think that that gives them the considerable influence throughout the country still, very much so. And that Pakistan... Uh, are they close to, the, can they rein in the TTP? I, I don't have the answer to that. It's a yeah. good question. Yeah. I think sometimes the more you know about Pakistan, the less you know about it. So, you know, in yeah, 2000, yeah, 2006 or so, I was at the U.S. Embassy and uh, having a few journalists there and the, the public relations person had taken us there. And uh, the US ambassador, I forget his name now, was on his, was just leaving and he was on his way to Baghdad. And he said, and he's an Arabist, and he said, Pakistan is the murkiest country I have ever worked in. <laughs> That's Ryan Crocker, who's an Arab. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, by the way, speaking, so when you do the oral reporting, I mean, are you, uh, are you, what languages are you speaking in or how, how do you do this? I mean, A, it seems very dangerous, a lot of this, and B, you're having to deal with some, I mean, it's Pashto for the Pashtuns and Dari for the Tajiks and Arabic for the Arabs. And how do you communicate? Uh, pigeon, very, very, very bad Arabic and very, very bad uh Pashto, that I know words. I do not know paragraphs. Um, I do not know complete sentences. It's that and always having uh, a translator as, as much as I can with me. Uh, and one thing I do want to say as regards to that, I remember going once in 2017, uh, and my translator refused to go. She was afraid um, to, in, in Pakistan to um, see the Akhanis. And it was Ibrahim uh, and his son and myself, only the three of us. And Ibrahim could see that I was nervous. And he said to me, don't be nervous. Don't be afraid. You were with us during jihad. We will never forget this. If you have no friends in the world, you can always come and stay with us. You are our friend. Every time I see him, he gives me big hugs. Um, it's, it's a very, uh, so how does strange, that fit into when you were strange. kidnapped in 2008 by the Taliban? I, mean, I did not answer that part of your question. I forgot. Yeah. Um, I was kidnapped in Bajur agency. For those of you who understand the tribal areas, size of Connecticut, it's the far, in the far North. I used Jalaluddin's name as much as possible to try and stay alive in 2017, 15 when I met for the first time after 30 years with Ibrahim in Islamabad, in a guest house with all kinds of civilians there who were clearly part of the ISI. Um, we were by ourselves. I told him about the kidnapping and he knew nothing about it. Hmm. How long were you taken for? 45 days, six and a half weeks, yeah. I mean, and what, what was the circumstance for you being released? Uh, um, two things, a number of things about that. Um, one day, the, my lead jailer said that the political, he mentioned that the political officer had come to see him. That means nothing to the outside world, but, and it didn't mean enough to me at the time. But the political officer is a position created by the British. Uh, which, which the Pakistanis inherited and used as the British did, if not more so. And it's a man who has complete control or is supposed to control of and is supposed to know everything about each tribal area of the tribal areas of Pakistan. Think in some ways of say the Navajo reservation or a large Indian reservation in the US. Um, and he reports directly with, he has an unlimited budget and he reports directly to the prime minister. How would he know, how, what is the political officer doing with coming to see the man who had, was my main jailer? This didn't dawn on me 
for a long time that, wait a minute, Pakistan knows I am here. Yeah. Because what I felt was that I was kidnapped, but somehow I felt that it was it got out of the kidnappers' hands and became it became very dangerous for me with the, with the mock executions. And ultimate and a, a, um, a couple of weeks, three weeks or so after I was kidnapped, a drone appeared above us. My fixer who betrayed me asked if it could see inside and I said no. But of course, somehow the US knew the area where I was and I was ultimately um, ransomed. But I never could figure out who was ultimately involved because there were a number, just as in other kidnapping cases, that all of these cases have involved uh, this in some form or another, even though you'll never read it in the newspapers. Um, I'm very much involved, and Peter's part of this in some ways, the in the hostage world. So um, there, I went back it, and, and while I was doing this, to my researching this book, which led me back again to the Akanis, which led me to look deeply into who really kidnapped me and why, because I felt that the government was in some way involved. And another reason, as we worked out, as I was brought out, uh, as I was passed from one group to another, uh, very late at night, I noticed that the, the group, this one group that I came to was far more heavily armed uh, than any Taliban group that I had ever observed or seen photographs of. So I, I didn't, I feel it was some kind of, some kind of ISI backed militia in some way. So and, I- and Because we okay. have limited time, I want to get to this final uh, good question, which is, you know, the big question is how long will the Taliban be able to govern without viable engagement with the surrounding region and international recognition? Uh, great question. Um, one thing, okay, to answer that question quickly, is that what's, as I said earlier, that the U.S. is sending delegations to meet with Siraj Uh The U.N. is sending delegations to meet with them. The Saudis send delegations to meet with them, although they've just moved their embassy out into Pakistan because they're afraid of uh, rumors of an attack by ISIS. The Iranians are very much involved in Afghanistan. Russia has lost lost considerable influence because of the war in Ukraine, but they all have their agenda. China has just signed an agreement, uh, as people know, to, I think, for oil or coal in the North. All of these nations, China, Russia, uh, and one thing that is really concerning, it's, it's disconcerting, and this comes again from Siraj Jadin's mentor, told me just a week ago that a number of regional powers come and meet with the Taliban. Now, once, uh, and including those you know, world powers, not once has anybody talked about or complained about human rights. In other words, about what's going on with women. They all have their own geopolitical concerns. And they are, they're, they, are involved, they are not recognizing the Taliban officially, but there is a considerable uh, amount of... of exchange going on among the international community, meaning the UN as well as the US, and it's certainly not it's, you know, China and Iran, among others, and certainly Pakistan is there. So you think that, so to answer the question, I mean, I, I think you're saying that the a lot of countries are sort of treating the Taliban as a de facto government, and the international recognition issue is sort of a, seems like a non-issue then? Yes. Yes, that doesn't mean that there's everything is, is we're all aware of and the audience and the group here today is the 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 poverty, the the lack of food, the denigration, the uh, to put it mildly of women, all of those things don't exist. And uh, but there's also uh, and again, I go back to Siraj Dean's friend is that there's great danger, he said, in Afghanistan today, because the majority of the people are opposed to the Taliban leadership's treatment of women and this draconian way in which they are, are uh, handing down these, these dictums, particularly regarding women, has infuriated 
most of the public. And what is of great danger, and the Taliban are aware of this, of a brain drain. Doctors and engineers, men, women with degrees who they need to make the country grow. They need, uh, want to leave and will find ways to leave. The Taliban cannot afford to lose its, 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 its academic leadership, if you will, or the doctors and the engineers are gonna make that country somewhat modern. Jerry, thank you very much on behalf of the audience. The book is Without Borders, The Akani Network and the Road to Kabul. You can buy it, uh, if you, there's a button at the bottom right hand of the screen like to buy it. Um, anyway, on behalf of the audience, we want to really thank you, Jerry, and uh, thanks for all your very uh, illuminating insights today, and good luck with uh, the rest of uh, the book tour. Thanks so much, Peter, for everything. Thank you. Bye. Bye.